a, a number of uh, different uh, distribution channel. Uh, so it's going to be uh, try to cover all of them and see if there's uh, common points changes in the in the in the future for distribution. Um, and first, we'll start with the uh, introduction of the the, the, the panelists. Uh, very quickly, I'm not that interesting. I'm a consultant in the video game industry, and my name is Thomas Bido. I'm French, so if there's something weird, it's the French accent. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, but the, the panelists are a lot more focused on distribution, and I let them uh, introduce themselves uh, very briefly. Uh, David. Sure. So uh, good afternoon. My name is David Adams. I apologize. I actually was not on the program. Kind of crashed the party, so to speak. Um, I actually am the VP of Online Technology at GameStop. So at GameStop, I'm responsible for the, uh, the online storefronts, that's GameStop.com, GameInform.com, and now our newly acquired Impulse Digital Distribution Platform. And I also work quite a bit with integrating the uh, online and the physical retail digital distribution, uh, digital, excuse me, digital distribution channels. So uh, I can talk a little bit about how we're, we're at GameStop looking to provide new opportunities for distributing both physical and digital goods across multiple channels from a retail perspective. Emily? Okay. Um, uh, my name is Emily Greer, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Congregate.com, which is an open platform for games um, and game distribution. Um, um, our main uh, outlet is the uh, website, which has about, you know, between 14 and 15 million uniques. Anybody can upload a game. Um, and we add uh, community features, APIs, um, and monetization um, through advertising and virtual goods. We have a, a currency called creds, which is very similar to Facebook credits, only we had it first. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, we get about, uh, we have about 45,000 games, about 1,300 new ones uploaded a month. Um, we also have a, um, uh, um, Android app, um, and we're expanding um, in the um, mobile arena. Most of our games are single-player flash games, but um, we have about 75 using the virtual good platform, mostly uh, MMO, social games, that type of thing. And virtual goods make up about um, uh, between 50 and 60 percent of our revenue, um, and the rest is advertising. All right, hello everybody. My name is Yusu Akon, and I'm the CEO and founder of Amplifier. Amplifier is a cross-promotion network for games. We recently announced that we reach about 150 million monthly active users, primarily on Facebook. Uh, we've delivered about 100 million installs on the network. We just announced that we are launching on iOS and Android. Uh, we also have a network for web games. And um, tagline is get new users for free. Uh, works because people play more than one game. And if you only have one, your players are anyway playing other people's games. So why not benefit from that? So that's what we do. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so my name is David Perry. I'm the CEO of a company called Gaikai. And Gaikai is a company that's working very hard on building cloud gaming um, in a way that, that it makes it usable and accessible for everyone. And what that means is we kind of saw this problem really early, which is it is kind of shocking that you can't put professional video games on websites. There is no World of Warcraft on worldofwarcraft.com. You can't put Call of Duty on callofduty.com and the movie sites, like you can't have Avatar on avatar.com. So the, the, the question really that, that we, we sort of placed ourselves is how could we change all of that? What technology would have to be created? And if we do that, it allows us to also put games on all the media sites and all the, st the stores, even put professional games inside Facebook. So if you want to play Call of Duty on Facebook, that's just crazy talk, but it's not at all with cloud gaming. And so what we did is we built the largest um, and fastest network for doing this. We're live in 18 countries. We have the fastest network period. And, um, and it's completely open, so anyone can use it. If, I mean, if THQ wants a THQ cloud, we can have that set up faster than it takes them to make the logo for it. But the point is they can have a <laughs> private cloud, and they can do whatever they like with it. If they want to put games on retailer sites or on, publisher site, on their own publisher sites, um, that's exactly what it's for. And that's okay. what we're doing. Thank you. So I said to, I'd like to start with uh, some kind of getting some kind of basis, and rather than look at the future already, let's, let's look at the past two years. What have you seen in the past two years in your different, you know, uh, different sectors? What has been changing in terms of distribution? Um, and when I talk distribution, I talk about you know how to reach the users basically and tools to reach users. But is there something that has significantly changed, and what 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 is it looking like now? 
For me, probably the big change is uh, when I started making games, um, if you think of it like a tree, the trunk of the tree is you as the lowly developer making the game by yourself, for yourself, an audience of one, and uh, your mother maybe plays it, but that's it. Um, and then the tree grows as you start to reach out to more and more people. And so there's a lot of, a lot of companies and distribution systems kind of get caught in the middle of the tree, which is the hardcore, you know, dealing with, we're all squabbling over the same people, basically. And anytime anyone takes a, a step higher in the tree, which is what Zeng has managed to do, they increase the reach dramatically. And there is so much more people out there if you can just find a way to reach them. And obviously, the iPhone got a billion downloads in nine months. And, and, and the secret, I think, what I've learned from it is that it's not just a case of just hey, move up the tree, it's what moves you up the tree um, is price and convenience. Those are the most important things, price and convenience. And uh, I know you, uh, it's, uh, it's like heresy to say this to game designers because they think, no, it's all about the game design and the quality. Those are the most important things to keep it alive and to stop people churning out. So it's the, that will sustain. But to get them there, it's price and convenience. And you can see that people will play Facebook much more because it's so convenient, and especially if it's free to play instead of going out and finding a better game somewhere else. And so that for me is the, is, is the big change. How can you use price and convenience you know, for your company and, and, and use, instead of thinking as Facebook as a platform or thinking about you know, Congregate as a platform, think of all of that as your platform. Everything you can imagine, as long as you can place your games everywhere, um, that all becomes one enormous platform for you. So how do you monetize that? I think monetization is the key there too. I mean, really, both both from the standpoint of you know advertise ad, ad subsidized as well as you know free to play or virtual good games, and then of course the you know, the actual monetization of the iPhone platform. You know, developers having a, a conduit for not just being creative, not just reaching eyeballs, but having that result into meaningful revenue streams is something that has dramatically changed over the last several years. I mean, there's always been innovation. There's always been folks that have been able to create kind of interesting experiences. Um, yes, definitely, now you can get more distribution, but, you know, the plethora of, of, of stories or incidents of developers who have been able to make a meaningful living um, or even just to have a meaningful event with regards to monetizing their, their efforts is, is just been phenomenal. As a, as a former developer like yourself, I just I think that's just astounding. Um, and, you know, just, I'm excited about the additional opportunities developers have now to really make money mm -hmm. um, doing the things that they love to do, which is create games. You, you see? Uh, I think I want to add to Dave's point about price and convenience are absolutely very important. I think the one, one third leg of that is communication. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that what, what iOS and Facebook have done for gaming is that they've made it visible that my mom plays. They've made it visible that my cousins play. They made it socially acceptable and built a communication channel around distribution. So previously, email and was the primary kind of a spreading mechanism, if you will, of, of games and then word of mouth and advertising. Then the social layer is the third leg that's really driven a lot of uh, distribution and, I think, and kind of legitimized gaming much more. So uh, thank, thanks Steve Jobs and thank Mark Zuckerberg because I'm not a, not a ugly nerd playing games anymore. I'm more acceptable. <laughs> Pretty nerd. <laughs> uh, kind of. Emily, you? Um, I mean, I, I mostly agree with that. I mean, I think I, I would think of it in terms of, um, you know, uh, jump from um, jump to the browser in, um, in, in, in the web situation. I think in the describe it actually as a consolidation of platforms when you talk about mobile where it's, you know, games war. There were games on phones before, but the consolidation into fewer models and, you know, just an iPhone some, you know, a little more unified Android set allowed for essentially, uh, it, it unified the, the platform in a way that it made easier to develop good games and, you know, have it not, and, and have it be open where it's not being controlled by the carrier deck. So in a way, it's, it's, a, it's a switch of who was the platform holder and who was controlling the distribution. Anything that's in the browser is obviously much more open. Um, um, and, you know, that's been a real explosion. I think um, one other thing is that we're, we are on a somewhat of an accelerated evolution. Um, if you look at the sort of history of the industry, it took a long time to get through, you know, the various consoles and get from, from very basic black and white through to, you know, today's almost, almost photoreal games. Not quite there, but almost there. 
Um, if you look at Facebook, it's like hitting reset and starting again. We had, are you a vampire, are you a zombie? Mm -hmm. But very quickly, people, I mean, for anyone that's done any Flash development, the Zenga stuff, I know it looks simple and people love to sort of rip it apart, like, hey, it's just farming or something. The, the, the technology that's supporting what they're doing and how they've built it is freaking phenomenal. And uh, that's why it's so hard for other people to really em emulate it. Mm -hmm. But um, that, that technology is, is something that they are limited by. So the capabilities of Flash are holding back these companies. They've had a very accelerated growth that's in hit a, hit a brick wall. And, um, and that's my big concern, actually, is, is there's a lot of sort of struggle to fight against that wall right now. And you know, you can see that um, Flash is about to bring in 3D which is of course great, but the problem is that that's a tease because the, the more that they offer you to start to look like professional games, the more downloading that's going to be required so that the convenience just went away, which is, is going to be fatal. The cost will go up, which will ruin pricing. So if pricing convenience goes away, it's, yeah. it's death. So yeah. there's, a, there's a very complicated problem here, which is, is evolution is everything to gamers. They can't live without it. It's, it's, it's just, they will, they will take the higher quality as fast as you can possibly deliver it to them. You're seeing it with the iPhone as, as they go through each stage and they offer more and more capabilities. And people rebuy the device over and over just to get their hands on that new experience. And games, of course, are driving that. So for me, I think it's very important that we, we keep an eye on that as well, is what, what is the evolution that the, that the platform and the distribution system is, is actually enabling as we go along. See, I would disagree with you about that. I, I agree that, they, that, that they've hit a wall, but I think that has more to do with, with um, having mostly penetrated the people who really are interested in games on Facebook, and it doesn't really have to do with technology. I do think that a lot of the explosion of social games was introducing a lot of people who'd never played RPGs to RPGs, um, and, uh, um, and, you know, the, uh, you know, something so totally addictive um, 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 that they wouldn't, you know, hadn't been introduced to you and say, you know, the, the 1999, you know, casual downloadable. So it was moving, a lot of people moving over from casual downloadable puzzle games to RPGs, which is a different, so to me that's more, it's, a, it's moving people from a one-time buy to a relationship um, where you're getting into a game for the long term. And I think that's where, um, uh, you know, that's where everybody is working now is to, um, it's much harder to get um, a new customer, and Zynga and everybody else is working on getting more out of those same customers and keeping them around, and I think that's where, well, I where get, things are going. I get what they're doing with it. The problem is that if you play a professional soccer game, say you're into soccer and you play a soccer game, and mm -hmm. then you try to play flash soccer, mm -hmm. you're just going to have the world's lamest experience for, for soccer. Yeah. And if you do the same with um, driving or any other genre that you'd like to name, generally... But the experience is so so held back by the technology mm -hmm. that it's not something that when a gamer touches it and sees what they could be having, mm -hmm. as long as, uh, just to be very clear, has yeah. to be priced the same way, it can't mm -hmm. suddenly be more expensive, then it's very hard to go back. As, as someone, you know, as a owner of a, of a Flash portal, I'm, I'm going to have a pretty different perspective. One of the things, you, you know, you look at our demographics, um, our demographics, we um, are 85 percent male, 19, you know, median age is 19. We look at Comscore, we look just like IGM and GameSpot in terms of console ownership, and people are going back and forth between sort of fun, casual game, like sort of smaller bite games, deep free-to-play games on our site, and, um, and and then going to their console game. I don't think they're going to play, you know, I think it's hard to switch somebody from a shooter on a con you know, console um, to a shooter in Flash. It doesn't, you know, that kind of trade doesn't, I, I think you're right, it, does, it, it doesn't work. But as long as the core gameplay is fun, I think that uh, I mean, that's what people respond to. And I think the, the visuals don't, you know, sometimes they matter and sometimes they don't. I'm going to jump on Emily's bandwagon also because the, the, you mentioned convenience, and I think that's a key. You, when you start <coughs> introducing uh, high quality gaming, you may introduce controls, for example, people in the family like using mouse and keyboard at the same time. When a lot of the, lot of the gaming on iOS or Facebook is a one-click gaming, it's really as simplified and as fluid as possible. And you know, West and uh, mouse, it's not going to so, work. Or so just to be clear, it's, uh, I, I was really clear. It has to be convenience and price. You have to stay. It can't be suddenly complicated or, but but it, if it's visually more compelling. You know, just like, wow, what's this compared to, well, it's kind of basic, but I'll put up with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to go back is my point. So Going, that's the, but it's got to be fun. It's got to be just as fun we, or more fun. I love retro. I love retro to death. I was there through every step of it, right? I love it to death. But 
now that I can play something that's new, a soccer game today, not a soccer game of yesterday, because that's what the, that's what the technology allowed. I want to play today. So I want, I want FIFA, in fact, I want FIFA 2012. 2011 seems old to me. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's the honest truth. And, and that's, that's where the money is in the industry. Okay, let me refocus a bit of the, Sorry. the discussion. It's fine, it's very interesting. Uh, so going back into your, 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 your price and convenience thing, yeah. right now the price is the lowest price possible is free to play. That's something... That's not the lowest. The lowest is someone pays you to play. Okay. <laughs> okay. The most common in the moment <laughs> and in the lowest price. Sure. I, there's not many games paying people to play. I, there are people working on that right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, if we look at free to play as kind of the basis for the, for the lowest price, um, and if you look at convenience, uh, something that, that's kind of immediate. And convenience also goes both ways. It also comes from the convenience from the developers on publishing on the platform. If you look at, you know, old model console, you have to go through Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo to get approved, and you compare that to Facebook or to Android, uh, iOS is also extremely easy, so it's very convenient to push those games, it's very convenient to get access to those games, but the, then there's a, a, another problem that, that emerged, uh, which is the one I'd I, I like to, to hear you about, is how do you reach people when on the platform you have like 10,000 games? How do you people know about the game that exists? Yeah. How, what, what are the new distribution channels to push to those users? Because, because you know, there's that many people who are going to be featured by, by, by Facebook or, or Apple or, you know, congregate in some yeah, ways. So like what, what, what kind of yeah. like, what, what needs to happen or what is happening? One of the things that was interesting for me uh, when joining GameStop is, you know, for all the focus that's on digital distribution and often a lot of the focus that's on kind of like our, our core gamer, you know, there is a, the actual demographic and reach, you know, of gaming is very, very broad in, in the United States. You know, for example, I mean, just 40, over 40% of GameStop customers are cash customers. You know, so when you start to think about, like, discovery, you, know, you realize that how much discovery is not just happening online, it's not just happening through social networks and things that are really still somewhat targeted towards, you know, it's not a techno elite, unless a, a techno enabled environment. There's also a, a great deal of discovery that happens really at a brick and mortar context. And so one of the interesting things that's happening with GameStop is trying to figure out how we can actually bridge some of the more traditional methods of discovery. You know, we, a lot of people talk about curation and like the ability to kind of navigate through this level of large and growing, rapidly growing volume of titles that are available and get those to the true mass market. You know, the, the hundreds of millions of folks that are, are shopping, you know, whether it be at our retail outlets or our competitors' retail outlets. I think that you'll see more things occurring where GameStop and our competitors and, you know, are looking to try to, you know, find interests and find those opportunities to, to understand customers and to expose them to new content, whether that be mobile content, whether that be streaming content. So it comes with the relationship congregate. with the customers. It, it boils down to the relationship with the customers, and it's just in just the there is some there is power, leverage, advantage, you know, opportunity in trying to find out the most that you can about a customer, and then use that as a way to help them traverse and navigate just the this the huge amount of information op- and options that are available for experiences. That's something that GameStop's investing very heavily and it obviously has something to do with yeah. in our interest in Congregate. Yeah. Hey, David? So yeah, yeah, for me, um, wow, this is a big question. Because, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, it's a good one. Yeah. Um, in the old days, it was all about shelf space. And GameStop had to manage only at a certain amount. You had to right. fight to get on it. And uh, you really did have to fight to get on it. With infinite shelf space, everything changes. And GameStop's investing very heavily into learning how to deal with that. Congregate, I think, is actually, I use Congregate as a sign of the future because Congregate dove so deep that you have so many products uh, on your, uh, I've actually, I show a slide of Congregate where I'm on page 645 of games, <laughs> right? And the reason yeah. I show that slide is because if I'm on, on page 257, mm-hmm. the chances of you discovering my game are so low, mm-hmm. it's so hard, because uh, unless I'm paying for advertising, you can get so lost in, in a digital world where there's infinite shelf space and every game lasts forever. And if anything, that's going to be part of the challenge, I think, that, that, that GameStop is going to deal with is they're going to suddenly realize they can onboard all the games of the past too, which, of course, you know, there is some long tail value to having right. everything. And, um, and, and that's what users are going to start looking for is, I want to be able to play every song ever made 
everywhere I go. So I just need them all in the palm of my hand. I want every single movie ever made, and whichever service delivers that to me is the one I'm going to go with. And they're going to say the same thing about games. But when you have that infinite shelf life, then the, the one that I'm seeing really invest heavily into this is, is, funnily enough, Apple. They did not take this seriously to start, but when they ended up with the, with the App Store as complex as it is, and it's, 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 just, it's becoming an absolute nightmare for them, they're trying to work out that discovery. I think there's huge money it, um, for somebody. I've spent mm -hmm. personal time, I've, I've actually filed patents on this, I've been working on how to, how can you do discovery in a world of, of yeah. you know, 50,000, 500,000 games and, and, you know, this is, this is a whole area of investigation that our industry needs to take on really yeah. quick and deal with or else you're going to be lost literally on page 257. Yeah, well, and I'd say, I mean, one thing is actually is that there's, you know, with an infinite shelf space, uh, I mean, there, you can have an infinite catalog, but really shelf space is not, is on, on the web, on mobile, nowhere, it's not infinite at all. Sure. If you look at our, the distribution of the gameplays on Congregate, the top, Two percent of games do some do ninety percent of the plays. Um, you know, some of that is because um, let's. I'm going to be honest that like the bottom twenty thousand are really crappy games. <laughs> um, um, and um, but there's a lot of games that are sort of in the middle ground that don't get a lot of plays. I mean, we're doing a lot of work to try um, uh, in terms. You know, looking at I think outside of the industry and looking at Netflix and seeing what they've done with a, with, with a you know with essentially an infinite um, infinite catalog and um, are working hard on personal recommendation mm -hmm. algorithms but that's still you know I think that's going to open up um, you know us to giving more distribution to 10% of the games rather than 2% um, and uh, it's I think Actually, as it becomes easier to publish games, um, more and more uh, more segments of the game industry are going to look like the web, um, with uh, just discoverability as a tremendous problem both for players and for um, for but developers. But the key difference between the web and the games is going to be that on web, if I go to Google, I know I want a car, I will know I want a rental, I want an insurance. It know it will get me that. But mm -hmm. I want entertainment, like. Well, are you going to pick through my brain and kind of figure out what kind of entertainment mm -hmm. I want? And we've done things with collaborative filtering based on game sessions, and you know, it's still we work with about 800 games. Mm -hmm. And from that set of seeing like millions of transactions mm -hmm. a day, you can start pull out like, okay, people who play this may play that. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's it's, it's a hit and miss. Yeah, it's and you get that the people who like you know the popular games like the other popular games. Yes, is generally what what, yeah. what happens. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, so, go on. So what worries me is um, console manufacturers own the portal. They own the front door. They own, like, I turn on that console, that little letterbox that I'm presented with is all I'm getting to see into that world through. And they're representing our games with a single static icon. I don't know what size it is, 32 by 32 or 64 by 64, whatever it is. That's my $20 million game right there. Um, it's outrageous. And, and it's such bad design of how to, how to handle depth of, of search. Um, so we have... I just think it's an industry, we have a lot of growing up to do there, and we're watching everyone else around us, but we need to learn from them, and, and it's, it's going to handicap a lot of companies that probably deserve more sales than they get simply because of the paradigms we use. Um, I think it's worst on mobile, um, among other things, because in turn, when, you're, when you're browsing it, you're looking, you're, 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 you're always in such limited real estate, so the, the shelf space is tiny. The games are relatively small, bite-sized, therefore easy to make, um, and you're in, a situ in, you're in situations where now the distribution of games is being controlled by two, two platforms who don't want other you know, don't want any sort of competing platforms in there, but have only moderate interest in um, in really solving the problem. And it seems like that's something you know we're you know on the concrete side we're we're trying to trying to figure it out in a mobile context. But it is definitely challenging in a situation where um, um, you know you know Google and 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 and, and Apple are not. Are only considering, you know, are not really considering it as an important priority. Do, let, so, me, let me ask you, Dave. Do, have you seen examples on the movie or the music industry where they've actually solved this? Because they've grappled with this online distribution for a while, and I haven't. You know, I turn on Spotify. I've been using that for years. And I'm like, what should I listen to? 
the wealth of choices almost becomes a paradox. And you're like, they have like millions and millions of songs, which I know probably I would like on many of them. And I, I think this, I'm not actually too optimistic that this is going to get solved. We're going to get a better solution and a better solution. But it, it, I think the... Uh, example is I, I built, um, I, I hired an engineer just to do some R&D. And we, we, we tried to think, if we were powering Congregate, how would we view mm -hmm. the games? Mm -hmm. And we have, you have the same sort of thing where the paradigm we came up with, we made a demo of it, it worked, um, we thought it worked very well, was you had a, a, you're just using technology basically, which is you have a scrolling field of, of tiles to show you each game. And, um, and um, at the time, because Flash wasn't really capable of, 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 of the full vision, but you could actually, you could, so imagine you're looking at a scrolling map of, of 50,000 games mm -hmm. that you're able to just pass through like this very, very easily, and something catches your eye, and that's the way we are. We go, is that a soccer game? And click, um, and if you hover over it, it starts playing the game under, your, under the mouse. Mm -hmm. So you can immediately, I didn't even have to go through that goddamn advert, you know, that I have to sit 30 <laughs> seconds through to find out if it's any good. So I'm like, I'm hovering on it, and I see the, the soccer game being played, and I go, that looks actually pretty good, click, and then I'll, then I'll take the advert and go, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that idea that you can peruse at very high speed, and I, I, to be honest, that's one of my problems with the, with the App Store, with, with Apple, is I look at the stuff, and I have to flick through their three screenshots they allow, you know, can't have a little <laughs> video on it, can't do anything else, can't have an instant trial of it, they could, they could stream. I mean, I'm pro cloud, of course, because that's, that's my job. But hell, they can afford to use that kind of technology to give me an instant look at it. <laughs> running, it's money. And then, yeah, and yeah. then, then off I go. Yeah, but it's yeah, their you money. get a oh. lot of sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So whose job it is? Because I, I, I assume there's a... How many people in the room are, are developers? Okay, so, so all those people have that issue on where to, wh what channel to push through, how to make their game discovered, it's discoverable. Is it is the the role of the developer now to find a way to to shout louder than the others? Is it is it some you know is it you know the new generation of GameStop who will help that? Is it going to be new generation of publishers? Is it going to be tools? What what is going to what what should happen for for this to for this problem to be solved? I think it's absolutely the developers. If you're self-publishing and if you're not being analytical about your traffic acquisition, you deserve not to be noticed. <laughs> you know, you, you absolutely deserve to die a horrible death today because <laughs> as honestly, you know, if you put like this much money into developing your game, believe me, I was there. I put this much <laughs> in developing a game, I had this little budget left because I was counting on virality and that's how we ended up with Amplifier because we were dying and we needed a solution. So we ended up with something else and I'm not making games anymore. Mm -hmm. But you absolutely need uh, almost as much attention to, or you need a publisher somebody who's finally vested in your game and needs to go out and get that. But if you want to take control of your destiny, you need to control of your distribution. And you need to be very metrics driven to do that. Yeah. Though, I mean, if you're making, it, you also need to look at, you, when you're looking at your distribution, it may be looking at who can you work with and, uh, you know, put it on this platform. How many platforms can I put it on? Where can I take it? Because the thing is, is that, um, you know, we, a lot of the develop on our developers on our site um, are making, you know, kind of game after game, a new game kind of every three months, and they have their own portals, and people, you know, they're advertising their own portals in their games. Those ga those portals will get a, a uh, burst of traffic, you know, e you know, when a new game comes mm -hmm. out, but they, ca they don't have enough content to hold on, and that's what distribution really is about, is about the people who are keeping an everyday every week relationship with a customer. Um, and, you know, sometimes it makes sense for a game developer to do that. If you're, you know, develop, if you, if you have enough content, if you have a game that's sticky enough and you can buy advertising and bring it in, it may make sense for you to do it. But there's types of games where, you know, uh, it's not really, types of games and types of developers where it's not really going to make sense. So you should look at, you know, what kind of type, what kind of game do I want to make? Do I want to make, you know, a puzzle? Do I want to make an MMO? And really look around and think about your distribution options from there. And, and certainly being analytical about it is right, but um, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, publishers, GameStop, aggregators like Congregate may be the right answer because you'd rather make games. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So you need you cannot uh, you cannot afford so, to ignore it. Yeah. You have to make a very informed decision on which way you go. And if you do a half-assed job of mm -hmm. kind of self-publishing, mm -hmm. you're not going to go yeah. anywhere because of this. Uh, yeah. Because there's there's two parts of this question. There's mm -hmm. the distribution. You need to own your distribution. Discovery. That's a platform holder, mm -hmm. kind of, or somebody else who plays in a mm -hmm. a gatekeeper role. Mm -hmm. Or but the distribution. You if you're not thinking about it, if yeah. you're you're just making the game, then you need to just. Yeah. work with a great partner to take it to the market. And you should be thinking about it at the time you're deciding what kind of game to make because, mm -hmm. you know, how you're going to monetize it, how you're going to distribute it. Um, there, It depends game to game, game to game and channel to channel what's going to be appropriate. So for your question about should the developers do it, um, I, for me, it's the job of the developers to game the system. That's what they should do. They should game the system. How to game. Every system can be gamed. Yeah. And the guys that are selling very well probably are gaming the system. And um, I mean, when LinkedIn came out, the first thing I did was work out who the number one most top linked people there are, and I linked straight to them. I have over 12,000 people linked to me now, simply from just, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes of work at the start, right? And it's just gaming the system. And so, you know, you look at this kind of thing, there's people that come to these conferences, there's conferences very much focused on, on you know, distribution or iPhone or whatever it is your, your, your bag is. Find the people that have succeeded and network with them and just ask them, what are you guys doing? You know, over a beer, trust me, you'll hear some really interesting stuff. And, and it will not all be just, you know, well, I made the game and I put it out there and it just sold. Trust me, there'll be all kinds of tricks that you'll hear. So it's about networking and learning those tricks. And, um, and, and basically, I, I don't want to say it's exploiting the system, but it is, it is definitely using whatever, whatever you can do to, to, get, to make sure your product gets ahead of or gets seen more is, is, is very valuable. Yeah, and I would, I would agree that I would agree with everything you just said and add to it that, you know, it's not a static equation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just like you said, there's a window of opportunity that, uh, you know, what you, what you do with LinkedIn might not work anymore. Yeah. You know, so it requires basically developers just kind of staying on top of, you know, kind of working those, mm -hmm. you know, constantly networking mm -hmm. and taking a lot of ownership over, like, who is actually working to solve that, that discovery, the distribution challenge right now. Mm -hmm. You know, GameStop is here today. GameStop wasn't here two years ago. Talking, well, working with Congregate, working with, providing conduits like Impulse for, you know, distribution, PC distribution. There are other players that are, that were entering the space. That's a window of opportunity that's only represented where, where you can, you know, find those, those, those cracks that you can get in and have maybe an unfair advantage. Well, GameStop yeah. is actually a really good example um, because you can game GameStop. And the, the trick to gaming GameStop... <laughs> <laughs> no, not me personally. Yeah, right. <laughs> very simple is those guys, they, they want to be super relevant to gamers, so they want exclusive content. And if you come in with some very interesting exclusive content, that they can have and, and show gamers they're directly connected to the developers, the makers of the games they love, it's, it's a slam dunk. I mean, right. you, you can see the ears perk up. That sounds really interesting. Right. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, but if you don't know that, 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 that that's going to motivate these guys, right. um, then, then, you know, right. you're, going to, you're going to the meeting cold without something interesting to throw right. out on the table. Right. Right. And, and where there's GameStop, there are multiple yeah. other people yeah. Exi you know, <coughs> existing or new to the industry yeah. that you can, you know, similarly find a you know opportunity with. So, how do you get featured on App Store? Right. Exactly. Which, what are your contacts? And you know, larger developers have people dedicated solely to working with their uh, Apple contact to get them featured and stay in touch. And you know, as an independent developer, how are you going to get there? Maybe, maybe you have something so exclusive and so awesome on iOS that you so everybody, everybody is going to like, oh. And there's, there's a game like that out of a film like Shadow Cities, and everybody sees that, they're like, I need to show this to somebody, I need to show this to somebody. And it's like, if you get that wow effect, you know, I was on another panel saying, like, how do you best try to discover an iOS? Well, I said, you know, get featured. Like, okay, how do I game the system to get features? And gaming doesn't mean, like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean to be a bad thing. Like, how do my awesome content reach it, the it, decision makers? You're absolutely right. So I read uh, New York Times, I think it was. Yes. Uh, was the future of mobile gaming. Good it, friends of mine. Shadow <laughs> Cities, right? So I had to play the damn thing. And yeah. I probably dropped 60 bucks into it already. Yeah, so. well, <laughs> you're, just, you're supporting it. Finish the puppet. Very good. Yeah, Shadow Cities, go play. It's awesome. <laughs> And if you know anybody at Apple, get it featured. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gaming the system. That's, that's exactly what you just did. You just gamed the system. Right. Uh, okay. I know people.